Did you ever watch a sea lion or other highly active animal at your local zoo or in nature and wonder about how animals maintain normal body function in their different environments? The diverse range of strength and movement abilities of animals are the results of a combination of their protective and supportive outer structure, their skeletal support and the arrangement and abilities of their muscles, tissues, and internal organ systems. Among these features, animals have evolved an impressive number of forms and an array of functions. In this lecture, we'll explore the diversity of adaptations that animals have developed for protection and homeostasis. Sea lions are a great example of these physical adaptations. As you know by now, sea lions are mammalian carnivores, which means a few different things. First, that they have a vertebrate body plan and they have hair covering their bodies. Second, that they bear live young and feed them with milk. And third, that they eat other animals, in this case, mostly fish. So far, so good. But sea lions, like their pinniped cousins, the seals and walruses, are semi-aquatic. So they have different needs than both the land dwellers, like you and me and dogs and cats and so on, and the other marine mammals, the whales and dolphins. So what challenges do sea lions have to meet? First of all, there's the challenge of temperature regulation. Many of the pinnipeds prefer to live in sub-Arctic zones, where the water ranges from about 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, down to near freezing in the winter. On top of this, California sea lions spend part of their lives in water and part on land, in a region where air temperatures tend to peak in the 90s in summer and in many parts of the range below zero in winter. So a sea lion has to be able to adapt to dramatic ambient temperature shifts, not only from season to season, but sometimes from hour to hour. In order to carry on the processes of life, a sea lion needs to maintain a constant body temperature under all ocean and air conditions. In other words, sea lions and other mammals need to maintain temperature homeostasis. That word, Homeostasis refers to the process of maintaining a stable equilibrium in any physiological process. We know what maintaining a stable body temperature implies for us humans. Clothing. We have gear for summer and we have gear for winter, gear for rain and gear for sun. Obviously, sea lions don't have that technology. What they do have is fur and blubber. Sea lions have coarse brownish fur that appears black when the animals are wet. Like their cousins, the fur seals, they do have guard hairs that overlay a coat of underhairs, which are waterproof by oil from the skin glands, and which are designed to trap air near the body when out of the water. The animal's body heat warms the air, and the trapped warm air keeps the animal cozy. However, their undercoat isn't as thick as a fur seal's undercoat, so it can only provide so much insulation and it doesn't really insulate much at all when the animal is underwater. Sea lions also have skin that is water repellent and overlies a fat layer, the one that we know as blubber. Almost all aquatic and semi-aquatic mammals have some sort of blubber. Otters are an exception. Sea lions have a relatively thin layer of blubber, which helps to keep them warm and adds to their hydrodynamic shape while swimming. Blubber warms the body simply by being a poor conductor of heat. So what happens is, when sea lions eat, they obtain energy from their food. Some of that energy fuels body processes, and some becomes heat. The blubber then slows down heat loss to the external environment. In other words, it helps the warm-blooded sea lion to maintain temperature homeostasis in the cold water environment of the Pacific Ocean. So how do sea lions keep from getting too hot? Remember in an earlier lecture when we discussed different adaptations of the paws and hooves of carnivores and herbivores and how they compared to our five-fingered primate hand? Well, sea lions have yet another adaptation off that basic plan. Inside the sea lion's front flipper are a set of carpal, metacarpal, and phalanx bones, just like inside your hand. They also have extensive blood vessels around these bones, just under the skin surface, just like humans do. Now think about what you don't have inside your hand. 
Compared to the rest of your body, your hands contain very little fat. The same is true of a flipper. Insulation is very poor here, but this is actually an advantage. Sea lions can hold their flippers up like sails to either absorb the sun's heat when they're cold or to dissipate heat into the wind when they're hot. The cooled or heated blood from the flipper exchanges heat with other body structures as it circulates, helping to thermoregulate the entire body. Finally, if it's very cold and there's no sun to be had, the blood vessels in the flipper can constrict to minimize the loss of body heat. Thermoregulation is just one of the purposes of an animal's outer body covering or integument. Skin is one type of integument, but this word can also refer to the membranes of small creatures or the cuticles of insects. Technically speaking, the term refers to the protective body covering of a creature and any external attachment to that covering, such as scales, hair, shell, and so on. The function of the integument layer is basically to keep the outside out and the inside in. It helps maintain the homeostasis of physiological processes and values, like core body temperature and water balance. It is also a defense against invasion by foreign bodies and microorganisms, as well as chemical and mechanical injuries, including sunburn and dehydration, and even physical blows. Integument comes in many different forms. Water-dwelling invertebrates like clams, oysters, and other mollusks have what zoologists call a mantle. This is an outer fold of skin covering an opening called the mantle cavity, which contains gills and excretory organs. The mantle also secretes parts of the shell to increase the size and strength of the shell as the creature grows. This exterior shell supports and protects the soft inner parts of the animals. This arrangement is ideal for an invertebrate in a watery environment. But as invertebrates evolved from water dwelling to land dwelling, they needed to develop a different kind of integument. To maintain their total water balance, invertebrates now needed a water retaining cuticle structure to function as a protective outer layer. The enormous phylum of invertebrates known as the arthropods have a cuticle, a protective covering with living and non-living layers. The cuticle is secreted by a single-celled layer of epithelial tissue called the hypodermis, and it consists of a combination of chemicals, cellulose, fibers, and chitin, and is a complex type of integument. The arthropod's muscles are attached to the inside of this external covering, which also serves as a supportive exoskeleton. In the insect class of arthropods, the cuticle is made of three distinct protective layers called the epicuticle, the exocuticle, and the endocuticle. The outermost layer is called the epicuticle, and it consists of three sublayers. The outermost of these sublayers is a cement-like layer secreted by glands in the epidermis. In other words, the top layer is secreted by the innermost layer through pores that penetrate the entire depth of the cuticle. Below this cement layer is a thin layer of closely packed bipolar wax mo molecules, oriented so that their hydrophilic or water-loving chemical group is oriented inward toward the soft body parts and their hydrophobic or water repellent chemical group points toward the external environment. This hydrophobic waxy layer prevents the outward movement of water molecules and therefore helps to preserve appropriate water balance and to protect the animal from complete desiccation. The third layer of epicuticle is a layer of lipoproteins and fatty acid chains. The exocuticle and endocuticle, sometimes collectively called the procuticle, are made primarily of chitin and proteins. The exocuticle is the hardest cuticle layer, the thick armor plating of an insect. The endocuticle layer lies just above the epidermis and is softer and more flexible. In the larval stage, many insects only have this soft endocuticle. The exocuticle forms as the insect matures. It's said that bugs might be our world's next sustainable food source for humans. 
I've tasted adult insects, and I imagine we'll prefer to eat those grubs with soft endocuticle rather than the adults with less body fat and hard exoskeleton that are hard to bite and digest. Let's talk about a possible example. If you do a web search for the top edible insects you should try, the soft-bodied palm weevils from the tropics surely come up. These grubs are so high in fat, up to 70%, that you don't even need to fry them in extra, extra oil, and they're very soft-bodied. Apparently, they're so soft and delicious, you can eat them raw, like a moving but creamy energy bar. Since the adult South American palm weevil is an invasive date palm pest in California and elsewhere, eating their offspring might be a great form of population control. But the adults, so hard and crunchy on the outside due to their tough exoskeleton for drilling into the date palm with their long snout and for protection against predators and desiccation, well, adults probably aren't so tasty. Yum, so eat some grubs and save some palms. And don't worry, folks in the tropics still have these creatures in semi-cultivation in dead palm trees, so we can always get more grubs for our next dessert. Although we humans might need to turn to eating insects to survive someday, let's now leave them behind and turn back to vertebrates. In the vertebrates, we find another multi-layered integument in sharks, rays, and other cartilaginous fishes. The skin of these animals has several layers and contains mucus glands and sensory cells, as well as small placoid scales that are dermal in origin. These placoid scales, also called denticles, almost resemble vertebrate teeth and are found within the skin layer. These placoid scales contain nerves and blood vessels, and as the body grows, the shark's skin area also increases its production of new denticles. When the denticles reach maturity, they are like vertebrate teeth because they do not grow. Instead, they wear down and are lost. In amphibians such as salamanders, the epidermis is made up of several layers of cells. The amphibians are the first taxonomic group to have developed a dead, horny outer layer of skin, which zoologists call a stratum corneum. The stratum corneum layer is an early adaptation to life on land since it is protective and prevents loss of moisture from the body. And therefore, this layer is most developed in amphibians that spend much of their time on land. The dermis in these animals is thin and is composed of two layers. The outer spongy layer is called the stratum spongiosum and the inner layer is called the stratum compactum. The inner stratum compactum layer contains tiny blood vessels that allow cutaneous respiration. And this ability to exchange gases through the skin is even more important than lungs for oxygen exchange in many of these creatures. This layer also contains lymph spaces, nerves, and mucus glands, which are abundant in the stratum compactum. And the dermis contains poison glands in some species. Pigment cells, which are known as chromatophores, are abundant in amphibians and are found for the most part in the two layers of the dermis. The chromatophores of amphibians help in camouflage or as warning coloration. In reptiles, the skin is thick and dry and contains hardly any glands, except maybe scent glands for sexual activity. The dry skin with few glands is an adaptation to prevent evaporation of water which is what allowed the early reptiles to conquer the land. The stratum corneum of the reptile epidermis is well-developed and produces horny scales. We observe that reptile scales often form crests or spines, so these creatures are protected and can also display to other creatures. These dead outer layers of scales are periodically cast off as the creature grows a process that zoologists call molting or ecdysis, and that lay people call shedding. The dermis of reptiles is relatively thick and has an upper layer with abundant chromatophores in the lizards and snakes, as well as a lower layer with bundles of connective tissue. Color pigments in lizards and snakes create many color patterns 
that are adapted for camouflage or for warning coloration. Birds, of course, are now considered avian reptiles and also have a thick, dry skin like the non-avian reptiles, which is how they have also been able to conquer the land. Birds probably own the most famous of the color pigments in their beautiful feathers. Of the approximately 10,000 bird species on Earth, all are thought to see in color. How do they make colors in their feathery body coverings? The colors of bird feathers and integumentary surface coverings in other animals are either structural colors, like blues and other iridescent colors, or pigment colors, like melanins and carotenoids. Structural colors are achieved by scattering light, or the refraction of light, off molecules in the feathers or other integumentary coverings. That is, the structure of the feather proteins reflects and refracts light to produce color. Probably the best example of structural color in birds is the striking throat patch or gorget in hummingbirds. The iridescent throat patch in these jewels of nature is the result of refraction of light through the microscopic ridge structures of the tiny feather barbules. Think of how a prism breaks up incident sunlight into its component colors. The structural parts of a feather act in the same way to produce colors. You can easily observe this in common starlings and some other birds that also have feathers with iridescent colors. In blue jays, for instance, color production is found in feather barbs that consist of three different layers. Box cells cover a dark layer of melanin-containing cells, and this layer is overlain by a transparent and colorless outer layer. Irregularly shaped cavities in the box cells are filled with air, so scatter light. So when sunlight hits a blue jay's feather, the light passes through a feather barbule's transparent outer layer into the air-filled cavities where the blue light is scattered and the longer red wavelengths are absorbed. Any light that remains after being transmitted through the box cells is absorbed by melanin pigments in the feathers. So the blue we see in blue jay feathers is refracted blue light that is enhanced by the underlying melanin-rich black feather layer. Now you know why these beautiful American birds are so bright blue. Pigment colors, on the other hand, are produced by pigments like melanin that are produced in pigment cells. These pigments are independent of the structure of the feather and include the carotenoid reds in cardinals and yellows in finches. The melanistic blacks that occur in both the skin and feathers of birds like owls and crows, and porphyrins, which are chemically modified amino acids that fluoresce bright red in UV light and appear pink, red, or green in birds like tropical turacows and temperate pheasants. The pigment colors absorb the colors we then cannot see and allow reflection of the colors we do see in these birds. Interestingly, melanistic feathers are not only dark, they also seem to be structurally stronger than feathers of other colors. And feathers without any pigmentation, the white ones, appear to be the weakest. Zoologists think this is one reason some white feathers have strong black tips, because the black tips are tougher than the white parts of the feather. Sometimes the colors we see are the result of a combination of structural and pigment colors. For instance, green parrots have blue structural colors that are overlain by yellow pigment colors, and the combination makes the green that we observe. Scales, feathers, hair, and even beaks, toenails, and horns are modifications of the integument. The protective integumental layer needs to be assisted by some other rigid support. Animals have two basic kinds of support, hydrostatic or rigid, and rigid support systems can be subdivided into endoskeletons and exoskeletons. Support can be offered by a fluid hydrostatic skeleton. Many invertebrates have a hydrostatic skeleton, which is best understood as a closed compartment that holds fluid inside and under pressure to assist the body in remaining rigid. Some of the most amazing of the invertebrates have this kind of support, 
including soft sponges. But maybe the most familiar example is the earthworm. In this type of support, the muscles in the wall of the tubular body have no external or internal means of attachment, but develop a solid muscular force by compressing against incompressible fluids. The earthworm can expand and contract against its body wall, and this provides movement to the creatures. Zoologists call this form of support a muscular hydrostat. Another muscular hydrostat is the trunk of an elephant. We can see that the elephant's trunk lacks any form of skeletal support since it is devoid of bones. It does, have, however, have over 40,000 muscle fibers, and they work because they are made of incompressible tissues that are maintained at constant volume by the elephant's physiology. An elephant can use its muscular trunk to maneuver a large tree trunk or even to pick up a tiny peanut. The amazing movements of the earthworm and elephant muscular hydrostats depend on muscles arranged in very complex patterns. The supportive tissue of invertebrates is a rigid exoskeleton, the development of which we described previously. So let's look at the supportive skeleton of vertebrates. The supportive tissue of a vertebrate's internal skeleton or endoskeleton includes the cartilage derived from the mesoderm germ layer and the bone itself. The vertebrate's internal skeleton gives the body physical support, protects the body's organs and organ systems, and is part of the musculoskeletal system that gives all vertebrates the potential for movement. We can return to the sea lion for an example of this. Sea lion flippers are incredibly strong, and in addition to helping them swim, these bony appendages help them to support their body weight while moving around on land. At the ends of their flippers are claws, which help the sea lions manipulate objects as a dog might. Like all vertebrate claws, sea lion claws are derived from epidermis and dermis. The basic skeletal pattern that we find in all vertebrates consists of an axial and an appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is a bony support provided by the skull and vertebral column. The appendicular skeleton includes the pelvic girdle and pectoral girdle that attach the long bones of the arm and hand supports to the axial skeleton. For instance, the long bones of our human arms and legs, and in the case of sea lions, their flippers. In sea lions, the ball and socket joint is found in the hip and shoulder and allows rotational movement in several directions like our shoulder ball and socket joint. There is a hinge-like joint like we have in our knee or elbow, which allows the animals to move their limbs in a two-directional way and allows the sea lion to move its flippers fore and aft. There is a pivot joint like we have in our elbow or wrist that lets us turn our joint in a circle. And in the sea lion, this joint allows them to pivot their flippers to the side as well as fore and aft. The sea lions use all of these joints in an amazing fashion as they support themselves with their flippers on land and move their flippers to fly through the water in one of the most beautiful natural ballets known in the animal kingdom. Bone is a living tissue that surrounds an inner bone marrow which helps with production of blood cells. On the outside of each bone is structural bone tissue, and between structural and the inner marrow is trabecular bone, which gives more support to the bone structure. The bone itself is very vascularized, so is capable of rapid growth and healing when injured. In bones, the osteocytes, or bone cells, are embedded in a matrix of calcium and other minerals. There is spongy bone and hard bone within the internal vertebrate skeleton. There are two kinds of marrow in bone, including red marrow that produces blood cells and yellow marrow that produces fats. There is calcium within the cartilage of bones that solidifies the bones. Joint bones, ligaments, tendons, and muscles all work together to produce movement. The bones support animals' bodies and help define animal shape. The joints are where two bones meet and make the skeleton flexible and enable movement. As in other animals, muscles are the stretchable masses of tissue that work with tendons and pull on our bones to make us move. The fibrous ligaments 
work together to attach from one bone to another. These parts of our musculoskeletal system work together to help produce movement. How do bone, tendons, and muscles work together to produce movement? We can recall that movement in vertebrates is controlled by muscle structures that we can see under the simplest of microscopes. There is cardiac muscle, and it is similar in appearance to skeletal muscle in that both types of muscle have cells that appear microscopically as striated fibers running transversely, and each of these contains thousands of myofibrils. The muscles of these animals and other animals is dependent on special contractile proteins. The myofibrils that help contract the muscles contain many myosin and actin filaments that interact as the actomyosin system and slide past each other to shorten the muscle during each contraction. The skeletal muscle, for instance, is fairly compact and is attached to parts of the skeletal system. It is responsible for movements of the appendages, respiratory and visual organs, our mouths, and other movable structures in our animal bodies. There are fast fibers and slow fibers of skeletal muscle. Slow fibers are often called red muscles and are mostly used for sustained postural support. Fast fibers are most often used for movement of locomotion. Tendons are important because the kinetic energy stored in stretch tendons are released later in the movement cycle to cause musculoskeletal movement. This allows vertebrate animals to move. There is also smooth muscle like we have in our stomachs, which does not have the striations of skeletal muscle and has smaller cells. It is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, so we are not conscious of its action and its contractions are involuntary. This muscle functions by sustained relaxation and contraction of muscle. Smooth muscle helps with digestion by pushing food through our gastrointestinal system, for instance, or by changing the diameter of some tubular unit to regulate air or fluid flow in the body. Every animal from jellyfish to insects to sea lions has solved the challenges of movement, protection, and homeostasis in its own unique way. This amazing diversity is another great example of how adaptation through natural selection allows animals to meet the challenges of their environment.